What happens when the human body is subjected to sustained physical movement and prolonged rhythmical music? The Bushmen of Southern Africa, or the Sun, have known the secret for 30,000 years and longer. Their trance dances unlocked natural body mechanisms to let them enter an altered state of consciousness. Through trance dancing, they had intense spiritual visions that traveled into the spirit world where they saw a great variety of phantasmagorical creatures. There, they also communed with the Creator. The key to the seemingly magical effects of the trance dance has to do with endorphins, a natural substance released by the body under certain conditions. Endorphins link to neuroreceptors in the brain to relieve pain and create a sense of euphoria. Endorphins are produced in the human body by a wide range of activities. These include meditation, deep breathing, loud laughter, spicy foods, acupuncture, running, long-distance swimming, and aerobics. And, of course, a rhythmic stamping of the feet and swaying of the body. In other words, dancing. That's also where the runner's high, the so-called second wind, comes from. It makes pain and exhaustion seem to disappear. But prolonged physical activity is not the only trigger. Music can have powerful physical and emotional effects on human beings. Classical music, rock, heavy metal, even music, all produce endorphins in the body. And of course, also the rhythmic clapping, foot stamping and singing of the Bushman trance dance. They were survival specialists, these first human beings of the southern African subcontinent. And their Stone Age culture has left us a wonderful legacy of rock art that has astonished the world. The skill to paint on rocks is entirely gone. Those artists can only be called back now through legends and through the art itself. Standing as a silent testimony of their relationship to God in nature. The healing trance dance, it is said, may well have been humanity's earliest kind of prayer, the original form of spiritual expression. Professor David Lewis Williams, author and authority on the sun, describes this power in his books. When the sun people dance, the women sit in a circle around the fire, and the men dance around them, and the dancing and the music and the clapping causes the nrum or the power which is in their stomachs to boil and it boils up the spine until it explodes in the head and then they get carried away to the spirit world and in the spirit world they experience all sorts of things they see sometimes geometric patterns that vibrate in their vision sometimes they feel very elongated like this figure here sometimes they become half human and half animal because they are blending with the potency, the nrum, that they got from those animals, and that changes them into animals. Indescribably ancient though the trance dance may be, its purely physical effects are also mirrored in modern terms, in rave clubs for example. Prolonged rhythmic movement, strobing lights, and the repetition of certain tones is said to induce a trance state. Very few sun communities survive today, and fewer still practice the true trance dance. Now, most do it as a tourist attraction. We visited a sun community at Ashkel, just south of the Khalakhadi Trans Frontier Park. 93-year-old Anna Vitboy is a matriarch in the small community. She ascribes her continued health to the trance dance. I'm going to say, what? I'm going to say, what? 
Wat sy nou gesê het, sy sê, die dans bring vir hulle sieninge en die voedsel, alles, hulle sy sê, is die drie dans, gezond die lewe, alles is die drie dans. The art of the sun speaks volumes about how they experienced God in nature. But interpreting this art is not easy. When Europeans first saw it, they came up with some quite fanciful explanations of what the art was supposed to mean. Some writers saw it as art purely for the sake of art, made from a desire to express oneself, to reflect daily life, and to decorate the rock shelters where they lived. Others saw it as the product of some pathetic magic, pictures made to increase herds of antelope by mystic means, or to get success in hunting by painting images of the prey. Today, we see sun art as an expression of complex beliefs, the product of rituals around which sun thought and religion were built. Wilhelm Blick, a German language specialist, did astonishing and important work during the 19th century by recording 12,000 pages of interviews with various members of the sun who had been brought to Cape Town as convicts. On seeing copies of rock art for the first time, Blick went straight to the heart of it by saying these paintings were not the mere daubing of figures for idle pastime, but the ideas that most deeply moved the Bushman's mind and filled it with religious feelings. Stephen Townley Bassett, the author of Rock Paintings of South Africa, Revealing a Legacy, has written a beautiful book featuring reproductions of sun rock art. His work shows how the art must have looked when it was first painted, the fluid lines and movement, the artist's astonishing powers of observation, their depictions of animal behavior. It's all wonderfully and faithfully restored in Stephen's work. The sun used what they saw as spiritually potent substances to make up their pigments, eland blood, for example. A very important point to remember about sun rock art is that for them, the rock stood between this world and the spirit world. And some paintings go into cracks in the rock and they come out of cracks in the rock and then people painted them onto the veil between this world and the spirit world. The concept of transformation, which underpins the complex and sometimes rather confusing wealth of sun imagery and symbolism, is key to unraveling some of the mysteries of the art. In his latest book, entitled Sun Spirituality, David Lewis Williams puts it like this, A hunted eland may turn out to be the rain. A man becomes a lion. A jackal barking in the night may be a shaman come to see if the people are safe and well fed. Khan, the trickster deity, dives into water, grows feathers and flies. At other times he may be a louse, an eland, or a snake. A bloodied feather dropped into water grows into an ostrich. For the sun, he says, transformations like these are part of everyone's thinking, if not their experience. They are a part of life. Sand rock art is extraordinarily rich in spiritual symbolism. It has been said, for example, that going into the trance is like going underwater or flying. Consequently, one sees many paintings of fish, turtles, and of shamans turning into birds as they enter the spirit world. Similarly, therianthropes, or half-human and half-animal figures, represent visions seen during the trance. Interestingly, science tells us today that a flood of endorphins in the body can also lead to similar visions of geometric shapes and strangely distorted or merged bodies. The sun speak of arrows or thorns that are a condensation of God's power or spirit that can either heal or cause sicknesses. Dangerous and malignant evil spirits 
were encountered during the spirit journeys of the Sun Shamans, offering an interesting reminder of what is said of spiritualism and the supposed dangers from evil entities when traveling on the astral plane. As protection against these entities, fly whisks were used to flick evil spirits away when traveling into the spirit world. Another recurring theme in rock art is described as threads or ropes of light stretching horizontally up into the sky or down into the ground. For the sun, people in a trance state were said to be full of spiritual power. They held and walked on the threads of light into the spirit world or floated above them. They were windows of spiritual revelation, the sun have said. Many paintings show dancers bending forward with their arms stretched out behind them, perhaps in supplication to the Creator. Many of these figures also show lines of power or rays coming from their bodies. There are certain recurring themes in San religion that one must understand. First of all, for them it's a very dangerous experience to go to the spirit world, very painful. But they do it because they wish to serve their community. And the whole idea of the religious dance is to serve people, to go to the spirit world and to serve them. And they do that by drawing sickness out of people who are believed to have sickness. They lay their hands on the people, they draw the sickness into their own bodies, and then they expel it through a hole at the back of the neck, which they call the Nile spot. So the art brings the material everyday world and the spirit world together into a unity. Shamans say that the force of the noon can be overwhelming. The stomach muscles contract so powerfully during the trance that it can fell a shaman to the ground. Because of this, dance sticks were used to hold the shaman up. Nasal bleeding and sweating, shown in the rock art, is a consequence of the highly aroused breathing that accompanies the healer's dance, and a loud snorting or snoring sound is made. Upside-down figures usually imply not actual death, but entering the spirit world in a trance. Where one painting was placed over another earlier one, it was not because of a lack of space on the rock face. A new image over an older painting increased the whole composition's potency and the meaning of the sight. In very broad strokes only, we have tried to sketch the hugely rich and varied symbolism in the complex spiritual existence of the sun. And today, we do understand a lot about this lost culture and the amazing body of artwork that are produced. But one motif has continued to puzzle scientists. Until now, that is. These strange shapes are called formlings, inferring some kind of unknown shape. Previous interpretations ranged from the bizarre to the almost believable. They were variously described as mud huts, cornfields, mats, grain bins, water pools, clouds, even maps. But these interpretations were far off the mark, as we are about to discover. The fact is, an unusual close-up view of a familiar object can sometimes make it difficult to recognize what one is actually looking at. Siyako Mguni is a rock art researcher at the Rock Art Research Institute at Wits University. And it seems that he may have made a fascinating scientific breakthrough. The more I looked at formlings, the more I began to think that there might be an unfamiliar view of a familiar object. Something that we see every day, but never get to focus in on that particular perspective. And you might say that the sun invented the extreme close-up. Here, he's a painting of a termite mound. What you see on the outside above ground, on the left of that, there, there's a painting of a termite with wings spread out, flying out of the termite mound in their mating flights. And just above the termite mound, really part of the same panel, is what you would see when you cut open a termite nest. This is what you would see. It is a close-up of the cells that are inside the termite nest. 
So why were termites important to the northern sun? Well, therein lies an hypothesis that suggests an interesting possibility. In the Matovo Hills just south of Bulawayo, formlings are especially prominent, but they become more and more rare as one moves south and southeastwards towards the high rainfall areas of the Drakensberg. The high altitude and the wet and colder climate there restricts the distribution of termite species that occur north and westwards of the Limpopo. Siaka feels there is a correlation between this and the distribution of formling paintings. It all has to do with why fat was so important in the diet of the sun. One hypothesis has to do with something quite special about their bodies. The Bushman hunter often had to be able to endure long periods of aerobic exercise during the hunt when animals had to be run down. Their bodies had to be able to store energy that could be used when it was needed. An important genetic adaptation allowed the early Bushmen to store fat in special fat cells in the buttocks. Fat cells work the same for all of us, but the Bushmen may have developed and utilized the body's fat storage mechanism to a high degree. Fats and carbohydrates are composed of the same three elements, carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. Fats have more carbon and hydrogen but less oxygen and they are more complex than carbohydrates are. In essence, fat produces more calories or units of energy over a longer period of time than carbohydrates do. When the body's energy needs exceed its intake, it releases hormones and enzymes that signal to the fat cells that they must release the fat that they have been keeping in storage. The stored fat goes into the bloodstream as free fatty acids. And as the heartbeat speeds up during prolonged running, for example, these fatty acids are sent off to the muscles where the energy is needed. It's perhaps not surprising that the great value of fat in the Bushman diet found expression in his religion. The eland, a key animal symbol in the rock art with their heavy shoulders and dewlaps, became God's favorite creature. And it was often overemphasized in relation to other animals. The eland bull female initiation dance is just one example. Formlings were painted mainly in Zimbabwe between the Limpopo River in the south and the Zambezi to the north and between western Namibia's Brandberg and Zimbabwe's eastern border. In Zimbabwe alone, thousands of formlings were painted. The question is, why is this so? Siaka thinks he may have found the answer. Eland numbers decline more and more as one moves north and west of the Limpopo River because the habitat there doesn't suit them all that well. Clearly, given the importance of fat, the sun had to find an alternative source of fat. And yes, you may have guessed it. Termites were a perfect substitute for eland fat. And, says Iyaka, that may well be the reason why more formling paintings occur there. Termites, in Bushman belief, were the first meat that God gave to humankind. Before all animal meat was created, then God felt sorry for the people. So he sent eland and kudu and taught them via dreams to make bows and arrows to kill this prey. And from that time, men became hunters of big meat. Meat protein is highly regarded in Bushman diet, and for an insect to be accorded an equal, or even premium status, is significant. Accordingly, the sun saw termite nests, or termiteria, as supernatural spaces, or portals into primal time, where all humankind was created and ordered. Termiteria were a dwelling place for God. Although occasionally painted on their own, formlings frequently have complex associations with other images in the Northern Sun's rock art. Termite nests are primarily wombs of fat. They are sometimes associated with thinly elongated lines that cut across their cells. And along these lines, there are human figures in transdiagnostic postures. Sometimes they have emanations from their mouths, their armpits, or their knees and they climb along these lines towards the top of the formlings. Formlings are sometimes associated with human figures that have distended bodies, and they are mostly women, 
and sometimes therianthropes, which are part human, part animal, tend to be associated with formlings, either coming out of the formlings or going inside. Formlings are sometimes associated with human figures that have distended bodies, and they are mostly women. And sometimes therianthropes, which are part human, part animal, tend to be associated with formlings, either coming out of the formlings or going inside. Formlings are commonly associated with a range of uh, powerful animals that are considered to contain supernatural potency. For example, eland are considered to be very, very powerful. Uh, even in the Drakensberg, you find lots of paintings of eland, and that is uh, one of the reasons why they were so uh, commonly painted there was because of that uh, supernatural potency that they have, because also of the fat that they contain in their bodies. And uh, there are also a lot of other different uh, antelope that are powerful. They are kudu, antelope, they are giraffe, which are also considered powerful. And there is a very beautiful giraffe uh, walking across the, the formling. And formlings, therefore, are symbols that refer to God's house, with great God himself being the essence of the ultimate source of Nun, which is the supernatural power that termite nests symbolize. <laughs> The simplistic view of the sun as innocent and abused children of nature that many people hold today is as misleading as the views of early colonialists who saw them as hardly more than animals and hunted them accordingly. The art testifies to the complex religious views of a race of Stone Age human beings that understood the creatures that shared their space. Their artists had an extraordinary eye for movement and the skill to capture the most recognizable characteristics of the animals they painted. Tragically, the paintings are rapidly fading in their rock shelters across southern Africa. Paintings that were visible just a decade ago are now already lost to us, forever, simply faded and eroded away, or deliberately defaced by the uninformed and the uncaring, who thought their names were more important than a legacy that is thousands of years old. These images may touch people differently, but one thing is certain. If we should lose this unique treasure trove, we will lose a heritage of great spiritual and artistic value. We should treasure the life lessons buried in the varied histories of our species. How to be good neighbors to all forms of life and revering God in nature are some of the lessons the rock art of the sun can teach us, provided that we're prepared to learn. Thank you.